Welcome. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Have you ever been in a true win-win situation in your life? A time where you're faced with a decision that no matter what thing you choose, you win. Like if someone were to give you $20 and they say, I have $20 for you. You can have it in one $20 bill or $21 bills. That's a win-win situation. You get $20 no matter what. Uh, maybe it's like a, a lollipop or a sucker. Same difference, right? You win no matter what. Chick-fil-A sauce or Polynesian sauce, both amazing. True win-win situations that we run into in life. In today's passage, we're going to see how three young men are in a win-win situation. And it might not feel like that as you begin to read the text. But we're going to see how their attitude and their heart towards God changes everything. It makes for you and me this a win-win situation. As they see God's sovereignty over every detail of their life. I'm going to invite you now to grab your Bible. If you don't have your, your paper Bible in front of you, I'm going to invite you now to go grab that, pick it up, get it, put it in front of you, and open up to Daniel chapter 3. And I'm going to invite you to read Daniel chapter 3 by yourself, right where you're at, and then we'll come back to the video. So go ahead and pause it or watch the screen behind you and read Daniel chapter 3. Now that you've read the passage, I want to invite you just to take a, a minute or so. And I want you just to pray. Pray that God would open your eyes to what he has to share with you through this passage. As we re read through Daniel chapter 3, there's a lot there. Would you just pray that God would open your eyes, that you might be challenged to hear from him even right now? Awesome. Well, it's good to be back together again. As you've just read, maybe one of the most famous and amazing stories in the entire Bible, right? This is a children, children's church classic, right? And just think for a moment how appropriate it is, as you read it now as, as a teenager, right? That we tell this story to children about not obeying or obeying, and if you disobey, you could get thrown into a fiery furnace, right? Like, how many Bible stories do we talk about death and cremation, right? To this degree. It's really actually a little disturbing when we think about it, right? But this passage is incredible. Like this passage is amazing. It's, a, it's an incredible story. And I think it's because we learn some pretty incredible and amazing things about who God is through this passage. See, it's not just about these three young men that we read about. It's really a story about God and, and mankind and, and God's sovereignty over mankind. And that's why I believe that we're encouraged so much when we read this passage. We learn about our relationship with God through these young men. And if you were with us last week, uh, our passage ended with Daniel uh, and Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar said to Daniel, like, your God is amazing. We see it actually in Daniel chapter 2, 46 through 47. He writes this. He says, To King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, paid homage to Daniel, and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, he says this, Truly, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries. Right? If you have been able to reveal this mystery, your God is amazing, is what he says to him. And just a little bit further on, right? We're only talking a very few um, verses later as we see it. Nebuchadnezzar creates a giant monument to himself, right? He, he builds this giant idol that we read about in the beginning of this passage. So after saying that, that Daniel's God was God over all, he was bigger and better than everything else, just verses later, after his almost submission to God, we see verses later 
that he begins to build the statue and monument to himself. I want to ask you just as we get into this passage today, have you ever found yourself in this situation where you had realized how amazing God was? You had submitted your life or yourself fully to him, yet to moments later, kind of look around and realize you had created your own idols in your life. That you were no longer surrendering your life to Christ. Nebuchadnezzar looked in every single way like he was about to, to surrender his life to God at this moment. And in that moment, just later, he begins to, maybe it's pride that wells up in him. Maybe it's fears. He looks around everybody that he sees and says, well, of course they're just to worship me and not this other God. Not Daniel's God. And he begins to build this giant statue, 90 feet wide, 90 feet high, gold plated from head to toe as we see in the passage. I mean, this was an incredible thing, right? Think about that for a moment. How many times do we do that in our lives and we set up our own idols? We begin to worship them instead of God himself. With that kind of as our backdrop, I'm going to get into a couple of things that we begin to see in this passage. A couple of things that we begin to grow in is, is we follow God as his people. And the first one is this, that God's people will be challenged with the idols of this world. Right? In, in many ways, the world has idols everywhere. They may not look like statues, but they look like other things in our lives. In our passage, these young men were told in many, many ways to pledge their allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar by participating in this great grand ceremony that we're about to see. And if they'd be confronted in a precise way, these Hebrew young men were, were, were told that they had certain idols that they needed to bow towards. And in reality, in our life, we start to create some of our own idols. John Calvin, a great theologian, actually said, the human heart is an idol factory. Think about that for a moment. That the own human heart, your heart, my heart, is a factory, like at one after another, producing idols. See, we create maybe these smaller idols in our lives. And for you, it might look like a hundred different things. It could look like money, it could look like image, it could look like, like whatever you might think of, grades or, or certainty or, or whatever that idol might be. Control in your life, we create these idols and we begin to almost worship them instead of worship the one true God. And that's what I want to draw us towards today. We, we want to draw us towards this idea that, that there are many idols out there. And I want to challenge you to begin not to worship those things, but to decide in your heart that your goal is to worship God no matter what. See, we also see in, in Acts 5.29, we see an example of this. And I want you to get your Bibles. I want you to flip them over to Acts. In Acts 5.29, we see something that it's the disciples' response. right? The disciples in the, the part beginning of Acts here begin to respond uh, to something pretty incredible, right? They began to have everything in common. The church began to grow together. They began to tell people about Jesus, right? And in 529, we see that there's some, some um, the apostles are arrested, right? They're, they're being brought before the governor. They're being brought before people in front of them. And they begin to say, and they respond to him with this in, in 529. He says this, but Peter and the apostles answered, Right? When they were given a question of, of what is it that you're doing and why are you doing this and why aren't you following these laws, he answered them with this. Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Where do you think they learned that? Where do you think they grew from that? It, it came from a basis of, in our lives even, that we are to obey God first and foremost. We see it in these three young men in Daniel. We see them obeying God and following him first. The question is, what is your response to these idols? 
as they come up in your life, do you begin to bow to them? Do you begin to bow to things that are placed there by man rather than what's most important? And those are the things that are placed there by God. And before you answer that question, let's continue on. Let's look at the second thing that we see in this passage. That God's people will be criticized by people who worship this world. Right? That's just a reality. Uh, honoring and obeying God are not always the most popular thing in our world. Think about that for a moment. We see Daniel's friends here refuse to bow down. As you read the passage, you saw that they, they refused to bow down and that these other men, these certain Chaldeans, maybe possibly friends from chapter 2 that we saw, who their friends were, again, killed and burnt up as a demand by the king, right, for them not interpreting the dreams when Daniel did interpret the dream. And so we see these other men come, and they're like, no, 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 King Nebuchadnezzar, these three guys, they're not doing what you said. They're doing something different, right? And as we begin to look at this, we see what happens. Let's look at verse 12 together. He writes this. It says, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? These, these men are coming almost to tattle on them. Right? You remember a, a younger sibling maybe or a friend who's tattled on you at one point in time. Maybe you've been in that boat. That's what's beginning to happen here. They're coming in there. They're responding back to the king of what's happening. And I think it's because they have something against these young men. I don't think. I know. That they have something against these young Hebrew men. And so he says, And these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And we begin to see this. They come and they, they share that, that what's different. They, they're not worshiping these things and they're not doing what you have said, king. And when we begin to see this, it begins to change our hearts. Right? We see this. There's a fear that begins to set in. Oh no, they're not obeying what they're supposed to do by the king. And what is it that he's going to do? In our lives, we, we deal with this at, at different stakes. Right? Being criticized by this world. Being criticized by people who worship the world instead of God. I have a, a good friend who he, about 10 years ago, was arrested uh, and detained in the country of China. Because he was teaching people how to teach young people about God. Right? He was there training and teaching children's workers to go and reach children with the gospel which is actually illegal in the country of China. And where they were at got raided, and they ran up to the hillside, ended up getting caught by the Chinese police, and he was detained and kept and deported from the country of China. Right? There's people all over the world who have it a whole lot worse than we do when it comes to people around them criticizing them. See, we worry about what someone might think of us, what they might say, Around the world, people are worried about someone killing them or taking their life because they are choosing to follow Christ. Again, there are people all over this world that have to stand up to criticism for following God, just like these young men are. And a question off of that develops for us. Are we one of those people? Do we have to endure criticism? Are we faced with it because of us following Jesus? Are we faced with criticism in our life because we choose to follow God's path instead of the world's path? The third thing that we see today is this, that God's people will be challenged to worship false idols. Right? We see this in our lives every day. Per, um, sorry, pressure to conform to this world is immense, right? There's, there's a great pressure out there. You feel it as a young person to conform to this world, to look more like the world. The, the pressure is immense. It, it takes 
courage in your life not to compromise. Some of you know that, know that very well. That there's a courage not to compromise. And the reality is that to not compromise, your mind needs to be made up well ahead of time. I think for these young men to be in this situation where they're faced with with their own death, with these great pressures that are coming towards them, I think in their mind, they had to make up their mind long before this moment that they were going to follow God no matter what. That no matter what came their way, they would follow God. That they were willing to, to even give up their lives if it came down to it. That they would not worship a false idol that they would follow God and his commandments for them. We see this moment of truth that comes up in in verse 15. Let's take a look at it together now. In verse 15, it says this, Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lair, the trigon, I don't even know what that is, a hark, a bagpipe, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the image that I have made. This is the decree Right? This is the decree from Nebuchadnezzar. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? See, we're faced with these type of decisions, and maybe they're not this intense, but we're faced with following these idols or bowing to these idols every single day in our lives. From the minute you wake up, the world is challenging you, right? Instead of the horn and the pipe and the lair and all those things, like I can just say from the moment you wake up, the world would say to you, bow down to me. It might be that moment you turn your phone on in the morning. It might be that moment you turn the TV on. It might be the moment that, that you call a friend or check your social media. Whatever it might be, from those moments, you're being challenged to bow to the idols of this world. Do you understand what I'm saying? That it's around us everywhere. And these young men are an incredible example for you and for me. Right, to begin to grow in these areas, to begin to actually trust God at his word. It brings us to our fourth thing today is this, that God's people must be courageous in the face of danger. Right? We know that, and that's probably why, why we've heard this passage before, why we know it so much, and we think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we think of these, these three young men, and we know them for being courageous. I think that's one of the reasons we tell this story to children, right? Because we tell them about, about their courage to stand up for what's right. But for us today, we must realize that we are to be courageous in the face of danger. Regardless of what immediate outcome might come or or might be there because of our decisions, we're clear that we are God's servants and we will bow down to no one but Him. And so for us, we can learn from these young men. Let's look at verse 16 uh, through 18 here. I should have turned my page. And verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. (laughs) Right? Like they just kind of just let him know what's up. Verse 17 says, If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Right? And then in verse 18 it says, But if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So they're courageous in front of Nebuchadnezzar. This is the most powerful man in the world at this time. right? And they go to him as he's telling them to bow down and to worship this image. And they say, no, we're not going to do it. And if you throw us into that fiery furnace, we know that our God is able to deliver us. 
to, to take us from that, to save us in the midst of it, that he's that powerful. And then we see them also see something that's kind of interesting here in verse 18. Or as we look at verse 18, we see them say, but if not. See, now as we read this, you're like, of course we know the outcome, right? But as they're having this conversation with the king or just telling him no, they're saying, God can deliver us. He's that powerful. And if not, we still won't bow down. If God chooses in his sovereignty, is what they're saying, if God chooses not to, to intervene by saving our lives in this moment, we're still not going to bow down to these false gods. We still won't bow down to this golden image that you've created of yourself. Because they had made a decision earlier on. Because they had declared that they would follow God no matter what. They didn't know God's every plan. We don't know God's every plan as we're stuck in turmoil in our lives maybe. As we're going through the fiery furnace moments in our life. You may be in one right now. This, this pandemic may have caused in your life moments where you're like, I don't get it. I don't understand. And because you've made a decision to follow Christ long ago, because you've declared to God that you would follow after him, you've stood like these young men. Or maybe you've been swayed by the idols of this world. Control being maybe the biggest one to realize that we don't have control over our own lives. And God is ultimately the one in control. His sovereignty needs to rest over our fear of control, knowing that God is ultimately the one in control. Maybe today for you, that's what you need to hear. Maybe for you as you read this passage and as, as we study right now, it's that you need to hear that God is the one in control, no matter what. That he's got you. And even if it doesn't turn out like you hoped it would, you know it's going to be to his glory just as these three young men had shared. Even if we don't know God's every plan and every detail, we can begin to follow him. Paul wrote in Philippians 1, uh, 21, he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Ultimately, it's the win-win situation I was talking about. Right? Paul's writing to the Philippians that if he is to die... Uh, it, it's gain, right? He gets to spend eternity in heaven with God. And if he's to uh, live, it's to spread and share the message of Jesus Christ. For me to live is Christ. For, for him to continue to live is to live for God. That's what these three young men were doing. They were living for God. And they were re recognizing and realizing if they were to die in this fiery furnace, if God weren't to, to come and save them as they know he can, and said it in verse 17... If they don't do that, if he doesn't do that, the reality is they also win. It's that ultimate win-win situation that I talked about earlier. If I die, I know I'll go to heaven, right? If, if I don't and I continue to live here, it's, it's for Christ's gain. My life is his, which brings us to our fifth point. And it's this, that God's people can be confident the Lord is with them always. Right? God's people can be confident and know that the Lord is with them no matter what. In our passage, we see Nebuchadnezzar is extremely mad. Right? When we see this in, in later on, uh, that, that he gets extremely upset that they are not listening to him. Right? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, uh, these three men, right? they, they did not uh, listen to the king. And so he decides to throw them into the fiery furnace. He was so mad, he's, he declared and he wanted the fire furnace turned up seven times hotter than normal. Um, that's hot. It was so hot that it even burnt up the other guys who were throwing these men into the fire. These... Um, servants of Nebuchadnezzar or soldiers or whoever they were actually gave their lives to take the lives 
so they thought, of these three men. As they opened the furnace and threw them and pushed them into it, right? The reality is that it burnt up these other men. That's how hot it was. See, this wasn't just supposed to be a punishment for Nebuchadnezzar. As you begin to read and understand what's happening at this time, it was almost for Nebuchadnezzar proof that Nebuchadnezzar's gods, small g, right? These idols were more important and more powerful than the God of these Hebrew men, big G, right? God as we know him. And so the reality is that that this is not just something that he's doing, because he's saying earlier on, we conquered your land, so my gods and my idols, Nebuchadnezzar's, right, are, are bigger than yours, because obviously I conquered you, so your God's not as powerful as mine. That's what Nebuchadnezzar had thought. His eyes were opened in Daniel 2, and he submitted to God of the Bible. He, dis, he submitted to Daniel's God. But then we see right away, just again, mere verses later, he creates his own idol and tells people to worship him again. And then, in this moment, he says, that's it, I'm throwing you guys in this furnace. And they watched. They watched this, what was supposed to be cremation of these men. Watching them burn. But something unexpected happened. Let's take a look at verse 24 and 25. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men into the fire? Right? He, he's astonished, but he says, They answered uh, to the king, O true king, uh, he answered and said, But I see four men now unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt, right? And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. First of all, they were all okay. As they're viewing this furnace, I think they threw them in from a top and could kind of view in through the sides. We don't know exactly what it looked like at the time, but they're able to see what was going on. They see, I, I see these men. We threw in three. I now see four. And this fourth one looks like a son of the gods. That's all he could use to describe uh, who this person looked like. Right? And, and I think for us, there's an interesting small little study that happens here. As we see this, there's, there's thought to, was this um, an angel? Later on in the passage, we see him described as an angel and in, in children's classes, right? Uh, it's described to, to many as an angel. But there's also another um, school of thought, right? As we begin to look at this, that it wasn't just an angel, but it was really the Lord that was there with them. That it was the second part of the Trinity, Again, Jesus hadn't come down to earth yet, but he still existed as part of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this is what we call a Christophany, or a Christophany um, right? This idea that is, as we see and we read through Scripture, we actually can see, oh wait, maybe Jesus as the Son, as, as part of this Trinity, was involved in this moment. Right? As he's described as a son of God. Right? It looks like, like one of the son of the gods early on. And, and I believe that, that, that it might have actually been the Lord there with them, not just an angel sent from the Lord, but that it was actually part of the Trinity, that it was God that was there with them in this furnace. That God did not deliver them from the fire, right? As they wrote earlier, we see that. And and instead, he didn't just deliver them from not being able to go into the fire and and do something miraculous and and make the fire all go out. He he let them go into it. God did not deliver them from the fire. was the God who who met them in the fire and and delivered them out of the fire. Let me say that for you again. We're actually going to put it on the screens for you because I want you to see this and get this thought. The God who did not deliver them from the fire was the God who met them in the fire and delivered them out of the fire. See, students, God does the same with us. He doesn't always deliver us from the trials of life. He doesn't always take the trials away from us. But in his sovereignty, 
in his ultimate control of it all, he meets you in the fire. He comes to where you're at in your life and he meets you there in the midst of your trial. And the trials reach out to him. When you're stuck in these moments in your life, I encourage you, reach out to God in prayer. Reach out to him in worship. And he will deliver you from the fire. We see that happen in this passage. We know that the trials of life will come. I mean, we're talking to you through video right now, which means that the trials of life are here. But I want you to understand that God is sovereign over all. He's in charge of all of it, even the smallest details of our lives. 1 Peter 4.12, actually, as Peter's talking, he says, Beloved, I do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. A fiery trial, right? This is a fiery trial in Daniel. I think Peter's reminding them that, that these trials in life will come. And pointing back with his own uh, verbs here, right? There's this fiery trial, there's this imagery. And reminding them of, of what God did. In the New Testament church, he's reminding them. And this is after Jesus has come. He says, in the midst of your fiery trial, when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange was happening to you, that, that you can lean on Jesus. That you can go to him. That's my hope and my prayer for you today. And it's the big idea of our, our message. That God is sovereign over all the details of our lives. That God's sovereign over all of it. And that no matter what happens in our life, that he's in control and in charge. And that we can submit our lives to him and follow him. That's my hope in the midst of your trials. That you would lean into Jesus. That you would lean into what he has done for you. That you would decide early on, before you face any trials, that you would follow him no matter what. Let me pray for us as we close today. Lord, again, we just thank you for the opportunities that we do have. Whether it's meeting online, whether it's via video. God, thank you for these technologies and the ability we have to continue to study and meet together in your word. I, I pray that you would help us as individuals to grasp that message today. Uh, of you being sovereign over our lives and God, as we, we walk from this place, as we go to, to whatever it is that we're doing next, God, I pray that you would help us to live this out. That you would continue to remind us this week of who you are and what you've done for us. So that we can follow you with our entire heart, mind, soul, and strength. God, we love you and we thank you. Amen. Amen, guys. Thanks for being with us.